Hello, and welcome to Lecture 1 of Periodic Motion in Phys 1104. In this lecture, we're going to start by looking at what we mean by periodic motion, and then start to look at some of the properties of periodic motion by thinking about the energy of oscillating objects. Periodic motion is just any motion that repeats itself, such as this ball rolling back and forth between my hands, or this mass oscillating up and down on a spring, or this pendulum going back and forth, this ball oscillating back and forth in the bottom of a bowl, this ruler vibrating, or the motion of the coffee in this mug that's been disturbed. We've already seen an example of periodic motion because uniform circular motion is a repeating motion and so it's periodic. But we're now going to focus on periodic motions that go back and forth instead of around in circles. This type of motion is called a vibration or an oscillation. The two words mean exactly the same thing. We also use a vibration or an oscillation to refer to a single back and forth trip of something that is oscillating. Although we're going to focus on moving objects that are oscillating, not all oscillations are motions. For example, a heartbeat is an example of an oscillation, and many circuits have oscillations going on in them which are electrical oscillations instead of things moving. Also, not all oscillations are periodic. For example, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a climate oscillation, is an example of a chaotic oscillation. But we're going to focus on oscillatory motions of objects, and furthermore, we're going to focus on a particular type. These are oscillations that are like what a mass on a spring does. It's an important example, and it's partly because many other oscillations are, and I'm going to say vaguely, just like a mass on a spring. You'll see what I mean as we go on, but basically the idea is that the features of a mass on a spring oscillation are common to many other oscillations. But really the reason we're focusing on this type of oscillation is that it's very special, because it turns out that all periodic oscillations can be understood in terms of a mass and spring oscillation. Again, you probably don't know what I mean at the moment, but it'll become clearer as we go along. The simplest mass on spring system we can think about is a cart on a spring, or perhaps an air puck on a spring. In any case, some object attached to a spring, which can move with negligible friction. And when the spring is at its relaxed length, the vector sum of forces on the object is zero. And so we can use the term that we've seen before, which is that this object is at static equilibrium. And so we call this position the equilibrium position. And throughout this unit, it's going to be convenient to choose the origin of our coordinate system at the equilibrium position. Now let's think about what happens when we compress the spring and then release it. Many people, when they first think about this situation, think that the cart will simply return to its equilibrium position, where the vector sum of forces on it is zero. But that's not at all what happens. After we release it, the cart and spring oscillate. Let's think about why. We'll think of the system as the cart, the spring, and the wall. This is a closed system after you let go of it. At the moment we release it, that system has spring potential energy. But because it's a closed system, we know that when it gets to equilibrium, where the spring is relaxed and there is no spring potential energy, all of the energy of the system must now be kinetic. And so it doesn't stop there because it must be moving. It has kinetic energy. And so it continues on until it reaches the far point of its motion where it's brought to rest again when all of its energy is spring potential energy. These points where the object turns around and momentarily has a zero velocity are called the turning points of the motion. Another way to see that the cart must oscillate, not just return to the equilibrium position, is to think about forces and inertia. 
After the cart is released, there's a spring force on it, which in the case of this cart in this picture is to the right, and as long as the cart is to the left of the equilibrium position, that force always points to the right, because a spring force always points back to the relaxed length of the spring. And so the cart must get faster during its whole trip from where it's released until it gets to the equilibrium position. And so it's reached a maximum speed by the time it gets there, at which point it passes through because it's in dynamic equilibrium as it passes through the equilibrium position. Now there's a force back the other way during the whole trip from the equilibrium position until the far turning point. So notice that during the oscillation, the system's energy is constantly converted back and forth between kinetic and potential energy. Also, the force on the cart always points towards its equilibrium position, or it is trying to restore it to equilibrium, and so, like we've called it before, this is a restoring force. These are common features of all oscillations. There's always a conversion back and forth between kinetic and potential energy, and there is always a restoring force. The distance between the equilibrium position and the turning points of the motion is what you could think of as the size of the oscillation. We call it the amplitude. For a cart released from rest, the amplitude is just the amount of the initial spring compression. But of course, you could start a cart moving a different way. You could start it off with some non-zero velocity, in which case the amplitude wouldn't be equal to the initial spring compression. But in any case, you can see that the energy of the system must be directly related to the amplitude, because when the cart is at its turning points, all of its energy is spring potential energy. And that will be the spring potential energy of the spring when it is deformed by an amount equal to the amplitude. Here's what a position versus time graph tends to look like for a mass on a spring. It's a function that probably ought to look pretty familiar to you, but more about that later. Notice that we can see the turning points. So there is the left turning point of this cart on the spring. There it is passing through the equilibrium position and at the right turning point, back at the equilibrium position, and back at the left turning point. We define the period as the time interval to complete one oscillation. And so you can see on this graph that the period is 5 seconds. But note, that's from the left turning point back to the left turning point. But in fact, it's the time between any time and the next time that the system is in the same state. And so we could be going between the right turning points or anywhere else. The period is the time for a full oscillation, so that means a return to an initial state. And so, for example, I can time the period of this mass on a spring from the top of its motion until the next time it's at the top of its motion, but equivalently I could time it from when it passes through that dotted line going down until the next time it passes through that dotted line going down, and I get the same result both ways. Of course, if you're actually doing a timing to determine a period, you shouldn't just time one period. That's poor precision. You should time multiple and divide by how many oscillations have occurred, like this. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so now we know the time for 5 oscillations, and we can easily get the period, which is the time for 1 oscillation. So the period is the time interval to complete one full oscillation, except that it's best to measure it by timing more than one oscillation to get better precision. And so you would calculate it by measuring the time for some n oscillations, and then simply divide that time by n. The frequency is the number of oscillations per unit time. Notice that if you look at those two, you can see that the frequency must be 1 over the period. Now I want to stress, I rarely put equations into the first few lectures of any unit, and the reason I've put these ones in is that you shouldn't even think of them as equations. If you understand the meaning of period and frequency, 
then these equations really ought to just be obvious. If they're not obvious to you, then you should think more about the meaning of period and frequency, and in particular, think about how you would go about measuring them in practice. If you understand that, then these equations should be obvious. It seems to make sense that if you set a mass and spring oscillating, and you set an identical mass and spring oscillating with a larger amplitude, that the one with the larger amplitude ought to have the longer period, right? It has, lo it has farther to go, it makes sense that it should take longer to do it. But if you actually try it out, you see that that's not true, as you can see with these masses and springs. I've released them at the same time, and you can see that the one on the right is oscillating with a larger amplitude. But you can also see that they're oscillating in time with each other. They have the same period, despite the amplitudes being different. So the period doesn't depend on the amplitude for a mass on a spring, but that turns out to be true for many, but not all, other oscillations. For example, these examples that I've showed you, a pendulum and a ball rolling in the bottom of a bowl, and the surface of coffee oscillating back and forth in the mug, all have this same property that their period does not depend on the amplitude. Although, for these ones, that's only true for small oscillations, for small amplitudes, whereas for a mass on a spring, it's true for any amplitude. But what this tells us is that as long as the amplitude of their oscillations are small, these oscillations are like a mass on a spring. Let's think about some of the implications of the period not depending on the amplitude. So let's think about identical masses on identical springs, call them objects 1 and 2, and set them oscillating so that object 1 oscillates with twice the amplitude of object 2. Then, in equal time intervals, these objects must always travel so that object 1 goes twice the distance of object 2. And that means at any instant, object 1 must have twice the velocity of object 2. But for that to be true at every time, then the acceleration of object 1 also has to be twice that of object 2. Well, that's now very important, because look, at any time, object 1 has twice the displacement from the equilibrium position of object 2, and its acceleration is twice that of object 2, which means that the force being exerted on it is twice that of object 2. Well, that just shows us that the force exerted on these objects is proportional to their displacement from the equilibrium position. But we already knew that, because these are masses on springs, and Hooke's law tells us that spring forces are linear restoring forces. And so what this is showing us is that a force proportional to the displacement from equilibrium implies that the period must be independent of the amplitude, and vice versa. The period independent of the amplitude implies that the force must be proportional to displacement. So this tells us that any oscillator with a period independent of amplitude has a linear restoring force. Well, we already knew that a mass on a spring had a linear restoring force, but it's not so obvious that a pendulum or the surface of coffee in a mug or a ball in a bowl would have a linear restoring force. But since they have periods independent of amplitudes, at least for small amplitudes, we can see then that the restoring force for each of them must be linear. All of these have something else in common. Experimentally, we find that their position versus time is a sinusoidal function. In other words, it looks like this. And so we're going to define simple harmonic motion in two equivalent ways. It's motion with a sinusoidal position versus time, or equivalently, motion resulting from a linear restoring force.